And I don't know about you, but I want to build my life on the priorities that God declares our priorities. Our story, all of us in this room, starts with a man in the Middle East whose name was Abraham. That's where our story starts. Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. In Genesis chapter 12, the God who created everything revealed himself to Abraham and he said, I'm gonna bless you because you believed me. I'm gonna make a great nation out of you and through your descendants and through your seed, I'm not only gonna bless you, but I'm gonna bless all the other nations of the world. God's salvation plan for fallen humanity started with a man named Abraham. And the promise was then connected to Abraham, to his son Isaac, and to his son Jacob, who God changed his name to Israel, who then had 12 sons who became the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. And in Genesis chapter 17, God made and reaffirmed his covenant with Abraham, and here's what he said to Abraham. He said, Abraham, I'm gonna bless you and your descendants after you. I'm gonna make you a great nation. I'm gonna make your name great, and I'm giving you this land as an everlasting possession. Everlasting possession. Now, we in the Gentile church in the New Testament era, we use the word everlasting a lot. We, we quote it in John 3, 16. We say that he who believes in his son Jesus will have everlasting life. How many think everlasting life means forever and ever? Raise your hand. Okay, here's the good news. You're right. When God uses the word everlasting, he doesn't mean conditional. He doesn't mean to a certain point or a very long time. He means forever and ever and ever. When God said to Abraham, I will bless you and bless the nations of the world through you and give you this land that he scopes out the parameters as an everlasting possession. He's saying it's unconditional and it is forever. And so because of that, everything that we see in this book from Genesis chapter one all the way through the end of the book, and we're talking about end times, when Jesus returns, Jesus is not returning to Independence, Missouri. I'm gonna write that one down. No, the reason why I say that is if you're a Mormon, Joseph Smith believed that when Jesus returned, he was coming back to Independence, Missouri. I know that because Jane and I lived in Blue Springs, Missouri for two years, and there's a temple that Joseph Smith built there that they believe Jesus is returning to. The Bible in Zechariah chapter 14 says that when Jesus returns, his feet are gonna touch down on the Mount of Olives, exact same place that he left. It also says that when Jesus returns, when Messiah returns to the earth, he's returning to Jerusalem, the capital city that he calls the city of the great king, and it will be a city that is occupied by Jewish people because Jesus himself said, just before he went to the cross, to the city of Jerusalem and to the Jewish people, you will not see me again until, everybody say until, until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So Jesus connects an until, he, he describes what it's going to be like when he comes back. It's gonna be the end of the age. He's returning to the Mount of Olives, to the city of Jerusalem that's occupied by Jewish people to establish his thousand year reign on the earth from the city of Jerusalem over all the nations of the world in fulfillment of all the messianic prophecies that God gave in the Old Testament. So if the Bible is an Israel-centric book, and if God established a covenant with Israel, if our Messiah Jesus came through the line of Israel, and if Jesus is returning to Israel to reign and rule from there, and you and I are gonna be connected to that, we better get used to Israel. And we better also understand that as the things unravel at the end of the age, before Jesus returns, which we're firmly in the midst of, Israel is going to be in the, in the focus and in the crosshairs more and more. It's, it's this little, small state the size of Rhode Island. It's a piece of real estate at the center of Jerusalem that I was just at two weeks ago. That's about 33 acres called Temple Mount, Mount Moriah. And that's where Abraham was willing to offer Isaac. That is where Jesus turned over the temples. And it's where Jesus is returning. And so because of that, Israel is important to God because it's his covenant people. We're grafted into that covenant, even though we're, we're Gentiles. 
We're grafted into the blessings of that spiritually, but that doesn't mean God's done with Israel. He will fulfill every promise, every everlasting promise and every everlasting possession that he has declared because, not because the Jewish people or Israel are faithful, but because he is faithful. All right? There you go. So I, There's three people that agree yeah. with that. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, it helps solidify our faith because if God gives up on Israel then he would give up on us. He'd give us. up on us. Yeah. yeah, he's faithful. Yeah. And I think recently, do you, do you recommend any resources maybe about why Israel would matter to the Christian church? Or well, I just put that, a lot of hard work that into that. Now you mention it, <laughs> that's, that is indeed why I wrote the book, Why Israel Matters. Because so many people in the church, not just, not talking about Radiant, but I'm talking up in the American church, and really the church globally, wrestles with this issue. It's like, why, is, why are we focused on Israel? Isn't God kind of moved on beyond Israel? Isn't Israel the Old Testament? Why aren't we New Testament? And, and the reality is we need to know why Israel matters. Uh, and I, you know, I wrote the book on my summer break, which I don't ever do. But I wrote it because I felt like the Lord said, I want you to do this. This is important. And now because of the timing of everything that's happening in the world right now, I understand why God wanted that to, to be done. Not like my book's the only book, but my book is easy, it's an easy read. It's got 20 major questions that are asked in the book of it, and then a glossary of terms. So as you're watching the news, and you're listening to all the different arguments in society, in the election, if you're trying to figure out, uh, think about this. This is, this is not necessarily a political statement, this is bipartisan, but have you figured out that right now the central issue controlling the election of the most powerful nation in the world is focused around Israel. And it's not just focused around Israel, it's focused around Michigan and Israel. Because the reason why the current administration won't say anything about Hamas and Hezbollah is because they don't want to lose the Dearborn vote, which is about 100,000 votes. They know that if they say anything or encourage Israel to adequately deal with Hezbollah, they're gonna lose Michigan. If you lose Michigan, you can't win the election. So all eyes right now are on two places, Israel and Michigan. Over the entirety of the 8 billion people on this planet. If they're paying attention to it, we should pay attention yeah. to it. And you should buy my book. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Uh, check. Check. Uh, next question. Uh, this is from Preston from downtown. It says, I've heard people use Bible prophecy, which is pretty general, but Bible prophecy to pinpoint the exact year Jesus is coming back. And you've even mentioned other religions said this is the exact place he's stepping down. Um, so how much can we actually know when it comes to Bible prophecy? Like what's doctrinal and how much is more subjective or a guess or maybe more fringe? Uh, when I was a, a senior in high school, I was deeply involved in my youth group and in my church. 1988, for those of you who are trying to figure that out. I graduated in 89. I was a senior in 88. I was born in 1980, actually, I think. It's, uh, not that it matters, <laughs> but... Uh... <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Thanks for that. Uh, so in 1988, a, a man wrote a book called 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Returning in 1988. On Rosh Hashanah, uh, ninth, which we're in the midst of the days of awe right now around the feast of Rosh Hashanah, leading up to the day of Yom Kippur here very soon. So it was about this same time of the year, and I remember being a senior in high school, scared, uh, scared and excited. And I remember like friends of mine, like, I don't even know if I'm going back to school. What, you know, if Jesus is coming, I guess I'm just gonna skip class and just, I'm like, yeah, whatever. Um, so 1988 came and went. This chair, is, yeah, we'll to... it's the absolute worst chair I've ever sat on, okay. Um, we'll get you another chair, promise. You promise? Next service, Before I Jesus you. comes. Uh, I don't know if I have that much time, but yeah. Okay. Um, so 1988 came and went, and Jesus did not come. A lot of people then got discouraged or uh, just kind of wadded up end times Bible prophecy study because they thought this is, it, it doesn't matter. Nobody's ever gonna know Jesus. It's probably gonna be a thousand years. And I think that that's detrimental because here's what Jesus said. Jesus taught about two things more than anything else just before he went to the cross and his resurrection. He taught about the Holy Spirit and he taught about signs 
of the times that will lead up to his return. He did that because his disciples asked those questions. Matthew 24, what will be the sign of your coming? And Jesus, it's called the Olivet Discourse because he taught this teaching from the Mount of Olives overlooking the temple and the city of Jerusalem. And he gave very specific signs. He said, when you see these things happen, he talked about the fig tree. If you've ever read Matthew 24 and wondered, what's the fig tree? Well, the fig tree is a way of representing the nation of Israel. It, historically, Israel was always typified as a fig tree. So Jesus is talking about that. He talks about wars and rumors of wars and kingdom rising against kingdom. He talks about pestilence in Luke 21. He talks about the roaring of the sea and nations in perplexity and in distress. He talked about false Christs. He talked about false prophets arising that will deceive many. He talks about the love of many growing cold. And he gives a lot of signs. He talks about the abomination of desolation. When you see these things happen, in Luke 21, he says, when you begin to see these things happen, lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Now, Jesus wanted us to pay attention to it. And he gave, he said that the signs, part of the reason for the signs is so that the people of God would know that his return is near. Now, what he didn't say was, you can't, you will not know the day. Because he said, the day or the hour, no man knows. So anybody who tries to tell you they got the day pinpointed, they're wrong. Whatever day they say is not going to be the day Jesus returns. Lest anybody in eternity says, I nailed it. But what Jesus did say was he said, you can know the times and the seasons, the epochs and the seasons. In other words, just like right now, we can tell that fall's coming because the Temperatures cool down, the leaves begin to change color, gold meadow uh, begins to sell donuts. I mean, you, you know when fall's happening, football, people begin to warm up for football, and you begin to know that seasons are shifting in the same way when you begin to see Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, when you begin to see the things that are listed by Jesus in there, he says, begin to pay attention because you're shifting into that season. Now, fall can be three or four months long. And the season leading up to the return of the Lord could be years. It, it, will, it has been and it will probably be years. We don't know, but we can know the times and the seasons. And so we avoid speculation on dates, but we pay attention to the shifting of seasons. And what that should do is cause us to prepare our hearts and to live differently because we know that we're in a unique time frame. And I believe, by the way, people have asked me, do you believe that we are in the end times? Without a doubt. And do you believe that we are a generation that will see the return of the Lord? I, I used to say, I don't know. Now what I say is, I'll be shocked if we're not. I really believe, I will be surprised if I get to the end of my life, if I live to be 80, 90, whatever years, and Jesus has not returned I really believe that there are some things that have happened in our generation that could not happen in any other generation that I don't know how they will be able to escalate any further in the next 30, 40, or 50 years. If they do, I don't know what the world will look like. I don't know how. I, I feel like we are spinning at a speed and accelerating technologically and even sin and wickedness to a point that uh, it's not adding year by year. It's not escalating month by month, and it, it's leading us to a, it's leading us to a, well, as Jimmy Evans would say, a tipping point, in which I believe the Bible speaks of very clearly.